Thank you everyone for coming out tonight and uh, thank you to everyone here at the Port Jefferson Documentary Film Series uh, for screening this very important, inspiring film. Nicholas, um, so much I want to ask you. I think though maybe it would be useful if you can give us a little background in terms of the types of videos you've been making and how that led to you making this film. Yeah, happy to. Thank you so much for having me and everybody at Port Jefferson. This is my first time here. My dad's from Long Island, but Nassau County had never been to Port Jefferson, so I enjoyed my walk on Main Street, although it's really cold out yeah. um, for some reason. Um, I uh, run, I'm, I'm from New York City. I um, grew up making films with my friends on a VHS camera, and when I was uh, 17 years old, the planes crashed into the World Trade Center, and I went down with my video camera to go film and make a movie on my rollerblades going down from my high school in the Bronx. And in the subsequent years and kind of the war on terror and whole aftermath of the Bush administration, which is a sort of similar time to the time that you see in this film in terms of the kind of political climate of the country, um, I realized that I wanted to take my interest, which at the time was making you know action movies and music videos with my friends and really translate it into the kind of storytelling work that I thought could bring people together and erase xenophobia and combat all of the social ills. And I don't think movies necessarily can change the world, but I think they can inspire people to do so, or at least give a tool or energy to people who already believe in that. And so I started a production company to um, tell stories for brands. So uh, my company, People's TV, which produced the film, um, my sort of day job, is making videos for Greenpeace, for Black Lives Matter organization. We worked on ads for Joe Biden. And um, in doing that, I got a call in early 2018 from Liz Jeff, who you all just met in the film, who I was connected to through a mutual friend from the political ad world. Liz has an amazing backstory that you don't get to see in the film. Um, she was kind of high up on the Obama campaign. She's a political strategist for all these underdog candidates. And she had just lost a race when she was like looking for her next candidate when she was on that plane next to Adi. Anyway, she called me up early 2018 and said, I just met this guy on a plane. It's this crazy story. And we want to make a two minute launch video on YouTube for our healthcare organization. So it was like a client calling that needing a marketing film. And I didn't know exactly what to think of it. It sounded like a sort of sad story, like Tiny Violin, kind of like this guy's sick and let's raise money for healthcare and sort of sappy um, kind of thing. But I um, flew out to meet Adi and the very first thing I ever filmed with Adi is in the movie, which is when he has his shirt off at the very beginning saying like, let's get started, let's do the thing. And at that moment, like immediately, I knew there was something much, much bigger. I mean, obviously, I could never have imagined all the things that would have transpired in the film, but had this sense really early on of um, that this guy was very, very unusual. And um, I, this is my second documentary film, my last one I made 10 years ago. Um, and it took me, I've made some other fiction films and other projects in between, but it really took me 10 years to find somebody that I thought was this special that I wanted to like spend years of my life following, which is, it's a big commitment, um, even being around somebody charismatic like Adi. So um, long answer to your question, but at the end of that first meeting where I was filming him for the short kind of YouTube video about the Be A Hero campaign, I pitched him this idea of doing something longer. Um, we didn't know what it would be at that time. I mean, Adi wasn't any of the things that he is now and none of the things that you see in the film had transpired yet. But um, we had to ask right away because Adi was already pretty sick. Adi had already been diagnosed for a year when I met him and there wasn't a lot of time to waste. I know a lot of people like him for a lot of different reasons, but you said that you were looking for a subject for a documentary for some time. What are the qualities that you saw in him as a filmmaker yeah. that attracted you to his story? Yeah, so I mean, certainly his sense of humor was what kind of sealed the deal, right, in that first moment, that, oh, this is somebody who, and the sense of humor wasn't just like, oh, he's making it. He, he kind of used his humor to make people around him uncomfortable, as you see in the movie. And I think his whole like sense of humor to me is this kind of m metaphor for what he's doing politically. It's like this act of resistance that he's not going to let his disability or illness or his you know ultimate 
um, you know, health condition define who he is in the same way he's not going to let Donald Trump say what our government should be like or what, you know, the Republican Party says our government should be like. It was like this very defiant quality in him. And on a personal level, I just related to him a lot because we're about the same age. Um, Adi's parents live on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, right where my parents live, and he grew up in Southern California, which um, I did too after I left New York. And like, there was just this very obvious connection I had with him of like, oh, this could have been one of my high school friends, or this could be me. But I wouldn't deal with it. I, I can still say today that if this happened to me, I just think I would be very angry about, oh, my film career and everything I was doing and my family, and I'm so bitter. And yet he just turned this thing around. Not that it's not, a, not that it's not, I mean, it's more complicated than that, but he was dealing with these cards in a way that I wanted to understand. It wasn't really about politics or activism. I wanted to understand what the source of his resilience against this tragedy was and how he was able to make meaning. And that's what I think the film is about for me and the journey was for me about was trying to understand how somebody can make meaning out of something so meaningless. One of the things I like about the movie is that you don't only tell his amazing story, but one really gets an education about how uh, an activist does what they do. And uh, that wouldn't be an obvious choice. I mean, obviously it would be in there because that's what he does, but, but you really do seem to take the time to, to show the behind the scenes working of this campaign. Was that something that you knew you wanted to do from the beginning? Yeah, 100%. I wanted to really have the film be about how the sausage gets made. And we don't show everything. It's interesting because one of the questions I usually get asked first is, um, why did Adi let you do this? How could he let you into such personal moments of his life? And I can talk about that more, but that was actually really quite easy and simple. What was hard was getting access to the political work because they were very private about it. Liz really didn't want to be on camera ever. She was like, I'm a... I'm the person behind the guy, I don't... But all of the scenes between them to me are really like the glue of the movie because they illustrate, and the reason I wanted to lift the hood on that is to show that they're, yes, it's all strategic and it's um, planned, even that interaction with Flake, which seemed like, oh, this poor father, you know, randomly confronted this senator. No, it was like this whole planned encounter with this guy who was a lifelong activist. Um, and so the reason I wanted to show that was because I think it actually makes it more relatable and ultimately more inspirational to see like, oh, this is how this is done. You train people, you get your cell phone, you film it, you tag them, you give great speeches, like it's, it's doable, I can be a part of this. And of course, the like ultimate takeaway is if Adi can do this, then what's my excuse? How similar is what you do in these short videos and the kind of videos that he makes to the overall film? Yeah, the short, I think the, in general, the short kind of advertising work that we do, political or otherwise, usually aligns with this kind of politics and, and progressive um, goals that I wanna see achieved in the world and believe film can be a part of, but usually like you don't curse as much in the, in the, in the TV ads, um, you know, there's no shower scenes. Um, yeah. And, um, you know, we really tried to make this not propaganda. You know, I think that um, I don't believe in terms of the political work that my company does or that I do that a filmmaker necessarily needs to be objective. I didn't, you know, try to not become attached to Adi or try to not think that universal health care is a good idea because it obviously is, and I agree with him on that. I don't think that is part of it. I think you can still approach filmmaking um, journalistically while having your own beliefs and persuasions and what you want to share. Um, but with something like this, we, it's, the message didn't drive the film. Adi did. The film's not about healthcare. There's no experts yeah. telling you about what's wrong with the US healthcare system. There's no um, infographics that talk about you know, how the tax cuts affect healthcare. And that, to me, is a big difference between short work and this, is that I really wanted this to be through Adi's eyes and through his lived experience. And that's, that's part of the message of the film is that, um, or at least part of the message of Adi's work is that you don't need to be an expert to raise a voice politically. Your own lived, you're an expert on your own lived experience. And so whether you're an actual activist like Adi or you just get 
a healthcare bill in the mail that you know is wrong, like you can share that. And that story and your experience has power and meaning for other people. And when people get together and share their stories, it can be this kind of healing collective act, which can ultimately make the country a little bit better, as I believe Adi did. And I think that even people who are conservative or um, Republican, I think take, they, they certainly connect to Adi. There's um, you know, many places we went on the tour and you see little nuggets of it where um, we were in very, you know, we went through all of the red states. We were at old folks' homes in suburban Utah and the people there loved Adi because they, especially older folks, because they are at kind of the same stage of their lives that Adi's in. You know, they resonate and connect with him. And um, I think because of that, he has this ability to cross divides, even though he's obviously a super partisan political animal. Um, and to me, and even when we've shown the film, I showed the film in Arizona a month ago, and somebody's like, well, I don't, you know, agree with all that. You know, I'm a veteran. I don't know about all this government health care, but, like, that's a fine young man up there, <laughs> you know? Right. And I think that's, like, the beginning of the discussion. Yeah. yeah. You mentioned that a, a lot of people ask you about um, the access that you had. I was wondering, what were the ground rules for you in terms of filming? Because it seemed like you had really amazing access. And uh, you mentioned the shower and the cursing. That's all in the film. Um, yeah, uh, with, uh, in the case of Adi, um, getting a kind of access to his life was, was incredibly easy. Um, and the reason for that, I, he joked on a like, Q&A. We did a panel with Jimmy Kimmel. And Jimmy was like, why did you let these guys do this? And, and Adi said, I, you know, when Nick approached me, I you know, had to sit down and think about it. Rachel and I had dinner. We thought about what this would mean for our families and our lives. And I told her that what really mattered in the end is for me to be rich and famous. And, <laughs> and this film might help me do that. And um, of course, he was like joking in his computer voice, which made it even funnier, as, as everything he does is. But there's like this to me like a granule of truth in it which is actually that not that he wanted to be rich and famous but that he wanted to achieve certain political goals with his work and he thought that having a film about him would help that and so like him and I are buddies but it was a very transactional thing and and more on a more deeper level he understands that very personal painful experiences as I was talking about earlier are part of how you shape political discourse and you only get a taste of what Adi did before his diagnosis in the film because I really wanted the film to be about how, who he was after. There's, a, there's other movies about ALS, the patients about who are famous football players or famous musicians, and then they get it and how they cope. But I really wanted to show how his life kind of begins anew um, after ALS. And so this is all to say that Adi what understood inherently from his work as an organizer on other issues that telling people stories is a powerful way to shape policy. It just was never his own story. I could see him understanding the power of allowing you to be there when he's going through medical procedures and, and all that kind of personal stuff in the house. The cursing, I mean, some people might be nervous about that. It doesn't right. seem, like it seems risky for someone who is one of Time Magazine's most influential right, right. people. I mean, I don't really care, but, but I was wondering if that's something that like people from his team there was question, a lot like, of could there be yeah. any problems with that? There was definitely a lot of discussion about how much we should show him getting high, which was like all the time. Um, but we just, we just kind of like, I mean, that was every single night on that bus tour was something like what you see in that one scene. Yeah. So we just wanted to give a taste of it because it didn't really work narratively in the story. But there was some debate from Liz, you know, about what to show. And, and the, the conversations with Rachel were, were more nuanced. Um, I think for Rachel, um, and she's spoken about this in some of our Q&As, and, and her, our portrayal of her, which is somewhat enigmatic in the film, was one of the biggest challenges in the edit and the storytelling, because she's very private, as she says. But I think for her, she really wanted to have a time capsule of this time in her family and for her kids. She also, of course, really supports Adi's work, and so was on board with that. But as an example of things that we, there were ground rules for, um, they didn't really tell us they were trying to get pregnant, for example. So like, I was just as surprised, you know, as anybody else 
when they got the news and I was like, what do you mean? Like, how did that happen? And why wasn't I informed? Uh, <laughs> you know, this is like, this is very important for my movie. Um, but, um, you know, they, they felt like that was a private part of their lives and they would tell me along with everybody else when they were ready. So um, that's an example of where, you know, there was some distance. Um, but generally, I think it was, you know, transparent and with these shared goals in mind. It's always difficult when making a documentary to know when to end the film. So um, I know you shot tons of footage. H how did you decide when to stop and what to make for your ending? Yeah, that news was actually very helpful <laughs> because for me, I wanted to reinforce the, it was a very clean arc. We're all looking for like a three act screenwriting 101 structure where the character, your, your hero, is like faced with a challenge and then at the end finds that resolution. And for me, um, I wanted the film really to be about this moment in Adi's life where he has a child and is then faced with this devastating news about what it will mean for his family. And that work that he does of activism um, and finding purpose in his life and his work and, and I think helps him reconnect to what he can, the, the family, the father that he can be. And for me, that was very resonant. It also happens to kind of end right at the end of the Trump administration, but I didn't want Donald Trump to be in the movie because I you know, think this transcends any one party or era. So um, I think for me, it was a natural conclusion of you know, what I think is, it's never, you know, movies are always much neater than things are in real life, um, but it was a moment where Adi, his story had come full circle, where he thought that his life was over and then his family um, kind of starts a new chapter. You mentioned that getting footage from him was easy, but getting some of the other stuff was difficult. T tell the audience a little bit about what's involved when, I guess, when you had some of the presidential candidates, when you go into the Capitol. Yeah. Um, that stuff can be challenging to get the rights to it yeah. and, and permission. Yeah, that was um, tricky. We put together all of those presidential interviews, so we actually rented the studios, and it was kind of this multi-layered thing of helping them make these videos, but also kind of setting it up for the purpose of the documentary. And when we were filming it, we thought it was gonna be a much bigger part of the story and the way they put those together was fascinating. That's one of the things that was hard to put on the cutting room floor where that was like months of time meeting all those condensed into what ended up being like two minutes, a two minute sequence. But um, yeah, we were lucky that Adi had a lot of great access and Liz had this crazy bulldog ability to get us in anywhere. So sometimes we would use her and say, Liz, we need to be in that hearing room. And she would say, okay, Adi, doesn't testify unless the cameras are there. You know, this, these are his people. And so we, you know, we pushed her really hard. And, and a lot of, I think, documentary filmmaking is actually kind of similar to bird dogging. It's just being there in the moment and not taking no for an answer and understanding that the goal of what you're trying to make is ultimately really important. And we did have to reinforce that. No, we need to be in that room um, in order for people to understand years from now. So it takes a very long vision, both from the people behind the camera, but also from the subjects to agree and understand that. And a lot of the time it entails being rude. When we were in that room, in the hearing room, I was blocking the Congress people who were giving me dirty looks and trying to get us kicked out. But it was really important that we were there. And so I have this theory that you really can't be that, I don't wanna say you can't be nice as a documentary filmmaker, but you have to be always thinking about the people through the lens of the camera, not the people immediately around you, that your ultimate stakeholder is the audience, is you guys in this room. Um, and often you have to like sacrifice the comfort of people around you in order to get that moment. I think one of the worst things to come out of, just in my personal opinion, um, January 6th and what happened in Washington, D.C., is that uh, they promoted the idea that it was just horrible that people are in the Capitol building. Um, my fear is is that like some of the stuff that you see in this movie yeah. could be prevented in the future. Yeah. I mean, there's there's scenes in the movie where the police officers are telling them you got to get moving. Um, they are confronting politicians uncomfortably. 
Well, that stuff is good if you're an activist, I think. I no, think it could that's be used by both sides, really. Actually, we were designing the poster for the movie in January, and the original poster was Adi getting arrested with his hands up outside the Capitol. And then we were like, this doesn't work anymore. So we changed it to the Washington Monument because it was a little bit the same idea. But that's sad yeah. in many ways. Yeah, no, it's true. I mean, I think they, the um, Capitol rioters really kind of co-opted some of the same tactics here. Um, and it certainly changed the paradigm about how that stuff is perceived. Um, but yeah, this idea of confronting politicians and telling your stories is something that can use, be used by both sides, certainly. But what's powerful about it is you don't need, a, you don't need Fox News, you don't need a media right. organization or corporate lobbyists behind you to do it because you people like Adi armed with cell phones and social media can really build support. So I think it's, yeah, I think that is a danger that events like that will be used to prevent public discourse and activism. I know the audience has some questions, but really quickly, I know this film is going to be shown all over the country. It's going to be on television. Um, what are you most hoping that people take away from this film? Yes, I, um, first of all, folks here, uh, I'm really hoping that you tell your friends and family to see it if you enjoyed it. It's um, out right now on Amazon and iTunes and Apple to rent or buy for four bucks and that's really helpful to us to get our numbers up and get it pushed onto the top of the platforms and um, I really want people to be engaged with Adi's work specifically uh, and more people to be aware of him. I think personally that he is the um, one of the great civil rights figures of history. I think he may, you know, he's still doing amazing work every day. He's fighting right now um, for home care funding to be included in the infrastructure bill. This is a really important battle that some folks here may be aware of if they're um, in the advocacy space that um, there's this huge amount of funding on the line to keep people like Adi in their homes because there'll be funding for home care providers through the infrastructure plan. Um, he's very active on Twitter. He's still messing with all these same politicians and um, continuing to interview the kinds of people that you see there about policy and fighting this fight for Medicare for all, which I think may be winnable in our, in our lifetimes. Um, thanks to people like him, and so I, I think on one, you know, want uh, him to be thought of as, uh, you know, Rosa Parks or Cesar Chavez in the in the history books. I truly believe he deserves that, and I feel very lucky to spend that time with him and to be living alongside of him. And then beyond that, I think there's this, hopefully, something that for me anyway transcends politics about the movie. Just fun, you know, fundamentally one thing that you get being around Adi for years and hopefully for 90 minutes is just a deep sense of gratitude for what you have, your health obviously and your body, um, but also a sense of, of purpose and meaning and that doesn't has to be, doesn't necessarily have to be to go protest, um, although it certainly could be. I often think Adi could have been like writing the great symphony or something like that or making a great work of art or designing a beautiful building. He was just turning this terrible thing into something that healed other people and healed the country and found purpose in for himself. And I want everybody to be able to find that from the pain and challenges and experiences that they have. Well, I think the film certainly does that. And I'm happy that you made it and that a lot of people are gonna get a chance to see it. Um, do we have people in the audience who would like to ask some questions? You can just raise your hand. Yeah, Adi has some um, private donors that um, basically help him. Um, he does he he does have good insurance, um, and he is fully employed by the Center for Popular Democracy. It's actually the same place he worked, and his wife's a tenured professor at UCSB, which um, I think you see in the credits. And um, so he has great insurance, um, but that only covers I think one shift basically, and then the rest of it is covered by. Um, some family members and some kind of political patrons who supported his work and um, but he kind of acknowledges that privilege and is trying to use that privilege to help other people get it and um, I think that his medical bills are twenty thousand dollars a month um, his, his care bills I should say um, aside from insurance so it's 
really enormously expensive. And it's not just a US issue, it's, it's a global issue, even in places like Canada, where we showed the film, where they have great universal health care, uh, there's still issues around funding more home care and 24-hour care for ALS patients. Um, so yeah, I think in his case, his case is extreme, but it's representative of so many people's stories who are trying to stay in their home. Yeah, no, it's a great question. Um, so Bradley and Adi met at a protest in 2018. And um, Bradley's involved in all kinds of democratic causes and um, you know has a big fan base from the West Wing uh, audiences and now Handmaid's Tale audiences. And they became really close. Bradley was a big supporter of his mission. In fact, Adi was the officiant of Bradley Whitford's marriage to Amy Landecker, another actress. And Adi gave the whole, did the whole wedding with his computer voice. And when um, we were um, in production, I think in 2019, Adi connected me to Bradley and said, hey, you guys should talk because Adi, Bradley's a Hollywood guy. And Bradley basically said, well, I don't know anything about documentaries, but my friend Jay Duplass does. And so I flew out um, with the producer Amanda and we met Mark and Jay Duplass who were really known for their comedy work. And so we made a reel of all like the funniest and, and silliest stuff that happens in the movie of, that you see of Adi getting high and like we have other scenes where the RV breaks down and gets flooded with, with shit and like all that kind of stuff <laughs> that didn't end up making the movie to like show them this is really a funny road trip movie and um, they got really excited about it and then they came on and gave us um, some funding and support and connections um, and became the executive producers of the project. So. That was how that happened. And yeah, we we're very lucky to find most of the people who gave any support or money for this um, discovered Adi either through us or separately. And we came to them and tried to convince everybody how big a deal he was. And it was kind of hard in 2019 because he wasn't really on the map yet in the way that he is now. Um, so it was a lot of pushing and you know, raising the money for the project was very difficult. And, a lot of people thought it was too dark and too difficult subject matter. That actually continues today where even though we've had a lot of successes with the film and are getting to show it to you guys today and it is on all those platforms, um, Netflix, for example, passed on the film. They said the subject matter was too um, depressing, basically, for their audience, which, yeah, yeah, they said, they said, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I agree. Squid I mean, games. <laughs> yeah, that's right. No, people love. Yeah, I mean, that's what I said. They also have the Anthony like Bourdain thing, and like he's actually dead. Adi's alive and still kick, killing it. But um, yeah, it was. It was very. It, it's hard to make a movie about this, and it's it's difficult to get people to come out and um, see something about somebody going through this. So I, you know, I'm really grateful to you all for kind of overcoming that. And then it takes that word of mouth. Um, which again is why if you're on social media, definitely spread the word or just tell friends and family to rent it, which will help us. Um, our goal is really to get Adi to the Oscars with this movie. That would be the dream is to have him uh, roll up on the red carpet with it. Um, and so um, we hope that it's gonna make more people aware of his work. Me too. Yeah. Him to pop up. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm trying to get him to see it. I don't think he's seen it yet. Uh, Bradley Whitford, who we were just talking about, uh, knows Michael Moore. So I, I'm going to send it to him and see if I would love for him to see it. Uh, Michael Moore did a film called Sicko, yeah. um, which is about the healthcare system. And I think it's one of the I'd like to dream that this film is in that kind of canon of movies about healthcare. I mean, that movie attacks it dead on, but I think it's absolutely brilliant and it was something that opened my eyes to what's wrong with our healthcare system. And, and so mm -hmm. that, like, could, Yeah. Yeah, let him let him know. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, um, this, the scene where uh, all the political candidates spoke, um, well, where he wrestled political candidates. Mm -hmm. 
right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so all of those interviews are, are almost, some of them are almost an hour long. Um, they're all on YouTube, and they're very interesting, I think, including the one with Joe Biden um, and, and Kamala Harris. So those all happened, and that was really just an editorial trick of cinema to, um, they were very uncomfortable for a lot of it. And so that was kind of, to me, the essence of what a lot of those were. A lot of them agreed to do it because Liz told them, like, do you want to say no to the dying guy? Let me know, and then I'll put, <laughs> and then I'll put that on Twitter. And um, so they all said yes, but when they were there, a lot of them even had trouble looking him in the eye directly. Um, yeah, because it's hard. It's hard if if you see him for the first time. Um, you know, he's he's. Um, it can be it can be emotional, and I think it can be distressing, and I think it causes you to face your own thoughts about your own mortality and your own life and your own health and everything. So not every politician is up for that. And um, I wanted to show a little bit of that in that in that scene. But um, they are very revealing and important. And they, they had a big part of the, the primary season, which is now long behind us. Adi was not a Joe Biden supporter, as you can imagine, um, with uh, in, in contrast to some of the other candidates, although he ultimately endorsed him. Um, but we didn't want to get into the thick of the politicians because it was kind of like, who cares about them? It's about the people. You mentioned the Oscars. Um, we see in this movie how there's a lot of strategy that goes into political campaigns. I think it's just as political with the Oscars. I mean, do you have a team of people working right now? Yes. Like, what's your strategy? Yes. Um, honey, is it, are you looking at your, your watch? What? Are you looking at the watch? Yes. Is it time to go? <laughs> Okay, cool. Okay, got it. I, honey's, honey's my ride to get home tonight, so. <laughs> um, yes, we actually, uh, somebody mentioned Crip Camp, and we hired the team that worked on Crip Camp. It was Oscar nominated last year to help support this film. It's a very guerrilla, grassroots effort. We have a pretty small distributor for the film, so we're kind of scrappily raising money to pay for the screenings. All of the Oscars, just so you guys know, is like a total... Uh, racket, like pay to play, sending people fancy bottles of champagne and hosting events at hotels with fancy hors d'oeuvres to drum up favors, which Netflix and other big distributors just basically pay for. And I'm not saying it's, you know, rigged. It's just like anything in, under our <laughs> capitalist society, you know, that it's... Um, so we're trying to really do that from the grassroots. We're trying to work with people that know and care about Adi to host screenings. I'm doing screenings like this to make people aware of the film and support that. Um, and yeah, every little bit counts. Um, and uh, as I mentioned at the top of it, we did just get nominated for these Critics' Choice Awards, which is like a great precursor to that. Um, thank you. Um, and yeah, it's just very, very meaningful to me to be able to share this with you. I really encourage everybody who is on social media to check out Not Going Quietly Film. Um, you can also review it on our IMDb or Amazon page. All of that means a lot. And um, I'm also accessible on all that social media if anybody wants to continue the conversation with me online. And yeah, once again, my hat's off to Honey and, and you and the whole team for keeping people in movie theaters. That's like the most important thing to me is just that this experience of watching movies together stays alive. And I think the screening series is an important part of that. Well, thank you for coming out tonight, and um, best of luck with everything that you're trying to do with the movie. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Good night, everyone.